see everybody. So yeah, as Ross said, my name is Joe, and I'm an evangelist for Unity in Southeast Asia, Oceania, and India. And um, so I'm going to just dive in straight. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Mechanim, which is the animation system in Unity. Um, it's so how many? So we had a few hands on Unity users, and a few more people have just joined the crowd. How many Unity users here? Could I have a show of hands? That's pretty awesome. How many of you use Mechanim on a daily basis or have tried using Mechanim? Very few hands. Okay. So that's one of the things that, wanna, that we're going around and talking about because I'm really excited about how Mechanim works and what it does. Um, and Mechanim is basically the underlying animation system for everything that is animated in Unity. So typically it's being sold as the character animation system, but it really is. Um, the part that actually animates everything, and that is our goal as well, to be able to animate any parameter, any um, anything that you want animated in Unity to be done through Mechanim. And it's, uh, so it started out from a few different things, and typically, of course, uh, character animation uh, in games can be a bit painful to work with. So we came from trying to solve a few major problems that, uh, that, that caused a slowdown in pipeline uh, production. And one of the things is, of course, um, when you create animations, you use different rigs. So uh, artists had to actually create um, skeleton structures with similar names. Um, and then you, would be, you wouldn't be able to uh, use animations or models that you purchased, or you'd have to go in and rename them. So with, with the mechanism system, the first part where it starts and where you see it uh, come to life is actually when you actually import a model. So here I've got a little example here. And if you go into the rig, you've got humanoid. And so what we do is you can take any model, bring it in, and typically it auto configures all the bone names. As you can see here, my animation structure, my uh, skeletal structures. Can you see it on the side here? Okay, let me just move my screen there. There you go. Okay. So as you can see, it's called like BIP001 pelvis, BIP001 spine. And so that's because I'm using um, 3D Studio Max, the Character Studio biped. And so you can't change the name, it automatically comes in like this. And so what it does is we map it to a set number of names and we create an avatar file. So this avatar file will be the link between this model and other models. So an example would be, so here we go, we done. If we look at another model of importance, so this one is something I purchased on the asset store. And I configured this one. And over here you can see that we've got different bone names here. So again, typically in a typical um, game engine, you'd find that these two models are incompatible and you can't use the animation on them. And then here I've gone and also got some mocap files that I purchased as well online, right? And if we look at this, let's say, let's look at the runs, configure. And over here, you can see that, again, the model uses completely different bone names. So I've got three different sets of bone names, the two characters and this animation file. So I've got a few animations that I purchased, mocap files, and right now it can't it typically can't be used with the models I have. So in a typical pipeline, you, you pass this over to your animator or to your artist. You'd suck it into a 3D program, rename the bones, or take the animations, rename the bones in the animations, or he takes it in and goes, okay, we need to retarget all the animations to the one, to the model that I've done. But now it doesn't need to do, go through that process. So the animator can just sit in Unity, take all these things, and start using them. So the rig part is also quite cool. I want to show you, show you that again. Yeah, so what we've done here, we've actually like, um, we've done a few things. So the mapping is auto, right? So this part, it actually goes through a heuristics and a structural check. So it's a humanoid, if it's a humanoid character, right? And you've got, say, you know, you've named your the pelvis, you named it PV, and you've got the spine as SP, or and then the middle spine, you've got it as 0, 1, right? So even your names don't really have to matter. If you have something like a hand, 
L hand, it will look at that and go, okay, it's a left hand. But it will also check the hierarchy, so it automatically then builds up the, the structure and then auto and auto maps it to the required bones. So it's really, really fast, and um, it works 99.5% of the time. Sometimes it doesn't work when you have intermediate bones inside with really weird names. But as long as you have a basic human structure, it works great. So then the second part is you've got your animation. So I've got my animation here. And what we do is, again, we've, got, we've bought some mocap files. So with mocap files, typically comes the whole entire animation set. Um, some mocap files will actually have the start and end keyframes where you've got the character, um, not the character, but the model rigged up like this, and it starts off with this and then goes into the animation, right? So again, animators have to bring that into the 3D program and start um, splicing the animation, cutting out or trimming the animation, and then exporting it back out again. So here, I don't need to do that. I import the um, FBX file, the animation file, into Unity. And what I do is I set the area of animation I want to use. So as you can see here, boop, 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 let me bring that up. And let me choose an animation here. So this is the timeline of the animation that I've imported, the entire timeline. And we have these little markers that will tell you which frame. So So I just drag along and find the frame that I want, the start frame, and then I can go and find the end frame, right? And what you see on the right, which are these lights here, are basically Unity's analyzing the actual frame and helping me decide where the first frame matches the uh, end frame. So you yourself don't really have to keep looking at the little bits of the hand, whether it's the right hand or is the left hand. So I'm using just looking at this green light and saying and look and looking at the curve, the animation curve as you drag it, and you can see there's green, there's yellow, which is like not such a good match, and then red, which means not matching. So I just move along and I go, okay, I've got that somewhere there. And that's matching, and then I can preview that like that. Right? So again, you don't have to bring it to your 3D program, do a whole re-export of all your purchased mocap files. You can set then over here again where sometimes you might do some mocap where you've got a full set of motions. So you've got like a run with a run left and a run right, and it's all in one file. And here we've got, what we do is, we set up the actual different animations here. So I've got a run right here, run left here, and run. So it's all within, contained within that one FBX file, right? Because then when you do your, even your, mo your mocap file, you can just take it in as one file, and then not go into a 3D program, but just come bring it straight into Maya. Bring it to Maya, bring it to Unity, I mean. Not go into Maya, you don't need to. I was thinking like you bring it from Motion Builder, which they typically use for mocap, and the export FBX files, we can suck that in straight into Unity and work on that. So the other part, which is really cool and one of the really exciting parts, which again, it's something that um, you will not find in any other game engine, and really excited about this stuff as well, is root motion. So typically, when you animate a run character, right, you animate it static, so he'll be like, like this, and then code will actually transform the character. So then what you get is like, you know, feet sliding or feet not following the ground, right? And then of course you've got mocap, right? Which mocap you actually have the character moving along, the actual model is moving along. So then the animator then has to take that mocap file, remove the keyframes, right, the transforms of the whole character moving, right, and just have the positions and rotations in terms of where he's static. So that's a lot of work as well, especially when you're talking about a whole run animation with, you know, with a few thousand keyframes, right? So what we do is we go, ah, never mind, you don't need to do that anymore, because what we do is we take the actual motion from the animation file, so what we have here, so as you can see, he's previewing, and he's actually moving along, right, following the animation that was created or animation that was captured. And so then you're wondering, all right, cool, he's moving along, but what about his transform, his position? That gets updated along with the character. So his root transforms 
is constantly updated. Right? So then code doesn't even have to know where it is. You can actually go, all right, play animation, the character moves. Now, together with that, what you get with this is you get the motion and you get the direction at the same time. As you can see, he's turning a little bit and where the red arrow moves. So code doesn't actually have to figure out, like, you know, transform forward at certain speed and then rotate right and then transform forward and then rotate left and trying to figure out, okay, where's the character facing now? Because technically, you don't even know where the character is facing, right? You did a few rotations. You've got to like look at it and go figure out which way did you turn. Now, just code just gets direction and it's given to you from the animation file. So the animators now control a lot of the way uh, the animation is used in the game and thus getting your animation looking the way you want to in the game. So let's look at how we actually use this stuff. So we've got, revert that, okay. So we've got all these pieces in, right? And then what we do is, so I've got my little character here in the level. Just set him up like this. And we create what we call an animation controller. And it's gonna be, there we go. And to actually start using the animation game, I need two parts. I need a state machine, which is what it looks like here. So we use a state machine to actually um, sequence the animations that are played. So before this, what you'd do in any game engine is <coughs> you'd actually take the list of animations from the animator and say, okay, tell me what animations you have. Well, we have an idle, we have a walk, we have a run, we have a jump, and I want him to blend from one of these to another. And then we've got these different animations that, so you've got to go from idle, and then when he's moving this fast, you need to change him to a run, right? And then when you hit the space bar, you need to blend him into this walk, uh, to this jump. And then from there, when he goes back to idle, you can do something else, but he can't jump when he's in, when he's in idling. So you've got the sequence that this program has to take this little, all these lists and start like, you know, coding it and going like, okay, if he's doing this, play this, play that, do this. And it gets confusing and it gets really tedious working with these things. So in the end, in production, what we end up doing is actually, you know, animator sits there and goes, okay, here's a flow chart of the actual animations, right? So you draw out a flow chart, give it to the coder and go like, okay, I need him to go from this to this to this. So instead of just drawing out the flow chart on a piece of paper, you bring it into you start creating a state machine in Unity with the animations, right? And um, so I've got here, let me just bring, pop this window out. Here we go. So it starts off with the basic one, which is idle. And then I've got it going to run, got to go to jump. I've got it going to a little special animation here. And I've got it going to um, walk backwards. So very quickly, let me just show you a how easy it is to actually do one of these things. So close that. Where is it? Boom, boom, boom. So I'm just going to create a new animation controller, animator controller. Just leave it there. Bring my animator window back up. Okay. So to create one of these, really simple. All I do is I just go to the animation, and I can actually just look for animations here. and drag that in, right? So I drag the idle in. It turns orange because that becomes the default one, right? And I just go into a run, right? I can just bring in my jump here. So if I wanted him to be able to jump when he's, when he's an idle, so I go, okay, make transition, right click, make transition, bring him over, and then he goes, okay. I click on the transition, and here, I can actually control the blend and how much blending I want between the two animations. So when the uh, when he goes from idle into the jump, how much of blending there is. So maybe I want him to actually um, towards the end of his idle and then go into the jump, or I actually want to blend before in somewhere middle of his idle kind of thing. So I can control that as well. And then of course he goes into so it's a state machine. So he goes into the jump state. Then you ask, okay, what happens next? If by default, if I do this, what happens is he's going to go from idle. Oh, sorry, I forgot you guys. Okay, so he's going to go into idle. 
into the jump state, and then jump state, when the jump state ends, he's going to go back into his idle. And it's simple as that. And the coder all just has to do is, actually you don't have to do anything, you have to like just run this, attach this controller to the character, run it, and it works. So the second part is, and why it's cool is that, now, for example, I'm just going to remove these. So what we can do is, again, because it's root motion, and I want to be able to do certain things. So, like, I want him to go into the run animation only when his speed is a certain amount, right? So when he's actually moving at a certain speed to go into run animation. So, of course, he's idle, he's not moving. Then I want him to go to run. So I say, if he's, if he's uh, more than 0 or more than 0 0.1, go into an animation. So I create a parameter and just create, let's say, create a float, right? And I'll just name this a speed. And if you follow Russ's, Russ's tips, you've got to write it correctly. Don't misspell it, right? And then, oops, here we go. OK. So I've created, come back. Yep, so I created a parameter, speed. And then in my uh, transition, go make transition, run. So now I go into the transition. And in the conditions area, I go, my speed parameter is now available. So speed is greater than zero, right? Then only this animation will be triggered, right? So again, code doesn't have to know this. Code doesn't have to mess with this. The animator goes, these are the conditions I want to be met before it goes into each state. So now you set this up. It's ready to go. So let's go back to the little, the other animation controller which I have prepared. Let me just load up the scene again. Bring that up. Okay. Where is it? Here we go. Okay. So here I've got a few things, like I've got that banner keeps blocking my view. Okay. I'll just pull this over here. Okay. So I've got a few parameters. I've got speed, I've got direction, I've got jump, and I've got dance for one of the animations, right? So here, an idle. My conditions are pretty simple, straightforward, right? So if speed is greater than 0 0.1, then it's going to go into run, right? And from run, sorry. if speed is less than one, 0 0.1, then it's going to go back to idle. So the state machine, when you play, when you hit play, the state machine is going to look, it's, it's running in the background, and it's going to be looking for basically anything that changes these parameters. So. <coughs> So in the code, I would say take you know take the speed, that the movement, and then if it's higher, then it will just automatically play this animation. So then here for the jump, I've got so just the jump. I've got basically a bool, and it goes if jump is true, then it will play this animation, the jump animation. If jump is so, then actually it doesn't do anything. So I don't need to do anything, right? Because jump is true, I hit jump. The jump animation plays. So automatically when the jump animation finishes, I just want it to go back, blend back into the run. So it automatically blends back into the run. So to see this in action, let's hit play. And what we have is, so I've got it moving forward. I've got it blending to the side. And jump, and it's all blending automatically by that. And I'll show you the code here. Pretty straightforward. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Let mono load up a bit. Okay. So I'll bring this up here.
So in my code, can you see that? Yeah, okay. So all I've got is I'm looking at the animator state info, and I'm just setting if I get button input, jump is true. If not, jump is false. If input key down, I do another animation. And for the movement, all I'm doing is I'm setting the float speed and the direction from the input horizontal and vertical. So the moment I've got the input of horizontal, it takes that value, hooks it up to speed, and then if speed is, as in the state machine, if speed is greater than 0 0.1, plays animation, so it plays. And it's simple as that. So code all the code needs to do is this. The coder just needs to have the parameters. Where's my animator window? Where is it? Can I bring it back? Yep, so again, all this is set up by the animator. Code needs to know these parameters, and you're done. It's simple as that. So all this animation data and all the way the animation works is completely controlled by the animator. So now they completely get involved with it. It um, relieves a lot of overhead from coders, right? Um, and typically in production, you'd find like coders and animators would have to work together at some point because you know the code coder doesn't know what the animation is supposed to look like. So he might be like, yeah, you know, animation's working fine because I play and he does something weird, right? Animation's working. An animator comes up and says, no, that's not what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to be actually moving this way. So then you, you cut down all that time, right? Because the animator sits in here with the simple script like this, sets this up, and again, he's like, okay, run it. I've got input, test it. I've got jump. It all blends smoothly, right? And I stop, and I do a little jiggy dance, right? And that's just so that I can test an animation. So I can just replace that animation and throw something else in, and it works. Simple as that. So then I want to test the other character that I have, which is a character with bones in it, with a different bone setup. So let's go see if do that. So I'm like, OK, I've got this character. I'm going to throw this character in here. Then let's see, what do I need? I've got an animator, right? So I'm going to then choose the same animation controller. So that's the same state machine I'm using on the robot. Um, she already has an avatar, right? Then, of course, I need to add the, um, the script that I'm using. So I've got the script. And I hit play. And then now I've got these two characters running about, right? They both jump with the same animations. And they can both dance. So now I can easily test the different characters with the different animations, all without actually really messing with the FBX files or the animation files. Really sweet and simple. And so in that few minutes, I've just, well, in this past few minutes, 10, 20 minutes, I've actually got this up running, right? Which if you did a normal pipeline, the animator would still be in your 3D package trying to actually rename bones and try to retarget animations. All done quickly and fast. So it cuts down a tremendous number of hours. And we're talking in a typical pipeline, we're talking hundreds of hours saved in production. Yep. So that's a very quick, simple thing. Now, the other part, which, uh, which like I said, Mechanim is there as an animation system for everything. Um, let's look at want to show you like so I'm going to create a little light I'm going to put a light here and so let's say I wanted a light that was going to do something behind this guy let me bring that up okay then let's say I wanted this light to be some weird color here so let's say I also wanted to animate this light and say change it this is a very quick example so we'll get into too much detail but um, let me just uh, put that here. So if I wanted to animate this light, like, you know, changing colors. Um, so right now I've got the animation, animation, and not the animator, the animation window down here. Right. Let's bring this up a bit. Uh, where shall I put it? Uh, I think I'll put it just, I'll just leave it here. So light selected, right? 
And I click record, so it's asking me to save, in, save the animation file somewhere. I'm just going to put it here, and I'm going to put, let's call this changing light. Okay. So now it's in record mode. Um, as you can tell by the red indicator here, and the red, the uh, play buttons have gone red. So then I've got this light, and I say, okay, there are a few things that I want to animate. So I hit add curve, and so I want to animate the, um, do, 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 the color curve, right? So just add that to that. So now we've got this little thing over here. And as you can see, when, when I have a keyframe here and I have record on mode, in the inspector, the color itself, the word color, turns red. So I've got that animatable. So I can go up to this one here in the middle. Let's bring the timeline to the middle. Hit here, change color. It automatically adds a keyframe. And as you can see, it also changes color, right? So then I've got this animation. I can just like preview that, okay? So then what happens here is that now this guy, let's look at the um, animation list here. So I've got my point light, which now has a point light um, state machine, right? So this animation that I created just now is now a state in here. So I now I can create another state for the light, or sorry, another animation for the light, and bring it in here as a state and start creating different ones. So I wanted, like, say, the light to be changing from blue to red, then another one from red to green, another one from green to yellow, right? So I create the an different animations, bring it in, and then do the transitions between each and every one. And then so then what you get is, you know, just typically, there you go. Now I've got the light animated. Again, level designers, um, environment artists, animators don't have to sit with code and go, okay, can you change the light, you know, from red to green um, in 0 0.2 seconds, right? And of course, you know, it's like, yeah, okay, I think it doesn't look good, so can you change it back to maybe one second flashing, right? So each time a change like that go happens, you have to go to the coder who's trying to do his game code, and you're going to take away that time from doing that to just to fix this, which, which of course is an important part of the game, right? So then you end up with additional time that the coder has to work with. So here, animator sits down, plays with it, designer can play with it, right? Your environment artist can set things up very quickly, test it out without even talking to anyone because they can be working in on their on their um, on their machine, play around with it, show someone, say, okay, is this good? Then check it in, right? So the artist, art director, can be just sitting there, testing out stuff without even involving everyone else. And so that, to me, is the, one of the most awesome parts of Mechanim. Um, and this also applies to um, 2D 2D sprites, 2D textures. So you can take, uh, for example. Um, like uh, your animated sprites, um, and then create state machines for them as well, and then add them to uh, a full animation setup and play around with. So we're just going to load up a different project where I've done something like that just to test out. So what, what I was doing was I was like, I wanted to do a simple um, startup screen, like a menu, and what I wanted to do was actually have it fully animated like a title screen like this. Move. Move. Okay, hang on, let me just get a wide one here. Okay. Do, do, do. So, yeah. So I've got these little pieces, um, and I've got my, if you look at the prefabs. So these are basically made from different individual pieces. different individual pieces, and I've set up and prefabs, and so I've set up the, uh, basically the animator. Oops, there we go, there we go. So, state machine set up for, I've got a enter animation and a sway animation, right? So it's enter for it to come on screen, and then a sway for it to be looping around like that continuously, right? So this one has no scripts, 
There's no code. Basically, put everything in the scene and then just hit play. And I got that. We should do that again with the, with the wider screen. There we go. So, no code involved, right? All the movement, the looping animation. So now I can just go, okay, hey, you know, guys, this is the kind of title screen that we want to use, right? Then the art director can go, cool, great. Then all the scene gets passed to the coder, so we want some interaction on the little pieces. Then they create the scripts and throw it on and pass it back to me. I can still tweak the animation without hassling code, without doing anything. So we're working completely on your own um, without affecting the pipeline on the other streams. So again, this is like um, really, really exciting because I've never seen anything like this in any other um, system, and it's something new. And it's also, I understand why a lot of the Unity users have been a bit um, hesitant to uptake it because, yes, it is thinking in a completely different manner. It's in thinking in, in, in something completely brand new. But please check it out because it is so cool, it's so awesome, and it reduces hundreds of hours of production time. It really, really does. Um, we've seen some games, um, full 2D games, that have utilized the system, and they've cut down, I mean, huge amounts of hours in their production team. Artists are getting on it. Um, so typically, you've got you know, a whole bunch of coders using Unity, and the artists are going off preparing art. And so we've got some studios who are now like, you know, boom, they've got an artist on Unity as well. So then both are like working parallel instead of one waiting for the other one to finish right, and bring it up. So then you've got that extra hours in production. Now it's like both parallel, both working together, and both achieving what they want. So animators, art directors can actually achieve the animation, the look, the feel that they want in their games. And it's done really, really easy with so much less pain. OK, cool. So that's my little presentation on the mechanism animation system.